Good morning, everyone. My name is Bart Purcell. I'm the interim CEO at Unison, and I'd like to welcome you to day two of the 2024 Unison Virtual Summit. We're excited for another day of fantastic sessions, great discussions, and making new connections. As a reminder, after the keynote panel, which we'll get to in a moment, we have blocks of concurrent sessions, much like on Tuesday, that align to our three summit tracks, which are track one, AI and the future of teaching and learning, track two, data in action, track three is being student centered. Uh, I wanna give a big thank you to all our presenters, both from Tuesday as well as today. Putting something together like this is never easy and it requires folks to be very generous with their time uh, to share all the great work taking place across these institutions. So thank you very much to our presenters. The videos from sessions on Tuesday are available on our event platform. So if you go into the platform and if you go up to tracks and you see our three tracks there and you select one of the tracks, uh, the first thing you'll see when you land on that page are the sessions that are coming today. But if you scroll down a little bit on that page, you'll get to the bottom and see all the sessions that were aligned to that track that we're recording on Tuesday. So these videos will continue to be available on the event platform. And in the future, we will migrate these over to Unison's YouTube channel, uh, where they will sit alongside the great presentations from the 2022 Unison Virtual Summit. I again, want to thank our sponsors for making this event possible. Without our sponsors, we wouldn't be able uh, to put a free event like this together for all of the higher education community. So very much big thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we have a couple of sponsored sessions today. Uh, the first for our platinum sponsor in structure, Ryan Lufkin, VP of Global Academic Strategy at Instructure, will be talking about the generative AI revolution and update on Instructure's AI projects and approach. Uh, I saw a, a sneak peek of some of the, the things going on here at Instructure, and I think people will be really excited to take a look at how Instructure plans on leveraging generative AI and different uh, feature sets in Canvas. So we also have a session at 2.15. Dan Young, Chief Data Architect and Manager at Indiana University, will be discussing one of IU's many uses for Denodo. Uh, for those that haven't heard of Denodo, this is a data virtualization platform that in this instance played a critical role in a large scale cloud migration at Indiana University. Uh, as institutes continue to explore ways to safely deliver data to a growing number of consumer groups, uh, Denodo fits a, a great niche there in that space, so definitely worth checking out. And our colleagues at Kaltura provided a session yesterday, the next step, digital experiences toward a personalized campus for all. Uh, that is available in the event platform. So you can go back and you can view that at your leisure. So thank you again for all of our sponsors for making this possible. So as we pivot to our keynote, before I stop the slide deck and we bring our panelists to the stage, I wanna share some of our thinking and putting this session together. As the scale of our collective discussions around artificial intelligence continues to grow, we're to the point that almost every unit at our institutions, whether it's an academic unit or an operations unit, are engaged in conversations around AI. With this in mind, it's important we continue to expand our perspectives and understand the complex interconnected web of activities and initiatives at our institutions that AI is or likely will play a role in the future. So this panel is intentionally comprised of university leaders that are navigating very different dimensions. From this panel, particularly insights around AI's impact in areas of the university that are outside uh, the responsibilities of your unit or your role. We have four questions we'll start with, and we should have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, please, by all means, use chat, and I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, and you're also more than welcome to direct questions to a specific panelist when you ask your question. So with that, give me a moment here. I am going to stop sharing and bring the panelists up to the stage here. And it looks like we have the panelists here already. Fantastic. So with that said, I think uh, we'll do a quick round of introductions. And, and Amy, let's start with you. If you can just give us uh, a little bit of information about yourself, your role at Nebraska, and maybe just a general uh, idea of what is the sentiment at Nebraska around artificial intelligence at the moment? Sure. Thanks, Bart. So uh, my name is Amy Goodburn. I serve as the Senior Associate Vice Chancellor and Dean of Undergraduate Education at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And in this role, I oversee uh, 10 units that include our Center for Transformative Teaching, Academic Success, Career Services, Undergraduate Research, the Honors Program, all the good stuff. Um, I'm also an English professor uh, who focuses in composition and rhetoric. 
So I would say that the general sentiment at UNL toward AI is just all across the board, uh, depending on your discipline, your attitude toward technology, and understanding of what AI is. Most of our campus discussions have focused on uh, chat GPT, which of course was seen as a threat to academic integrity and pedagogy initially. Um, so in thinking about this panel, I reviewed all of my emails that I received about chat BT, uh, GPT between November and January of 2022 to 2023. And I found this one from um, a member of our College of Arts and Sciences Teaching Academy that I thought spoke well to sort of the sense that faculty had at that time. And he wrote, I think we need a rapid discussion as a community of instructors, probably before spring semester, on what are good practices. My mind could change, but I don't think it's out of line to send a clear message to all instructors. Naive at home essay writing is dead. If you ask students to do it, you are setting the stage for inequity and in assessment sorted by students' internal ethical decisions. You are not scaffolding the very learning you are hoping to instill. Rather, you are reinforcing for them that they're better off to outsource their thinking to a supercomputer. So in response to concerns such as these, um, our UNL Center for Transformative Teaching created a web page with resources and sample policy language that instructors could use, held numerous workshops and instructor consultations. And today, I think our focus is really on rethinking our educational practices, helping guide students into understanding how to better use these technologies. Uh, just a few weeks ago, our center held an AI petting zoo for instructors to engage in hands-on uh, with both Bing, BARD, and ChatGPT. Um, so I would uh, basically say that you know Adam Thier, who's a technology pol policy analyst, frames how as humans assimilate new technologies in terms of resilience or fragility. I would say initially our worldview was fragility and loss. And now we seem to have bounced back a little with resilience, but we have continuing trepidation uh, as the change continues to accelerate and we try to keep pace. Great, thank you, Amy. Alexander, do you want to give an introduction to yourself and give us a sense of what the discussion's like at the University of Florida? Um, sure, thank you very much for inviting me. So my, uh, my name is Alexandra Baton Bailey and I'm the director of the Center for Teaching Excellence at the University of Florida. And um, generally, I, I, I sense a more uh, positive outlook on um, AI and its uses, an outlook that sees it as a valuable resource that can enhance teaching and learning and student interactions when used appropriately, obviously. Um, I, I did, we did experience that, in, you know, that initial um, a trepidation and even fear uh, in the very beginning, but but we had begun laying the foundation a year before uh, ChatGPT really um, really set off alarm bells in that in November, um, and so I think that foundation gave us an opportunity to really um, help uh, dis dispel some of that initial panic um, a little a little more rapidly. I think many of our folks see it as and, and believe that it has the potential to improve their curriculum and offer benefits to both students and staff and see it as an obligation to help equip our students who go out into a working world that will expect them to have these capacities. So how does this become something that is deeply embedded in the, in the learning, uh, whatever field and content they are studying so that within those fields, they are equipped um, to use AI ethically and effectively. Um, and so I see that as being a, a, a desire of our faculty to develop um, both the, the, the practices for themselves, but also uh, the experiences for their students. Um, so, you know, many of our tools like ChatGPT are recognized for their ability to assist in tutoring or language translation or content creation and brainstorming. Um, I, I don't think all of the concerns about potential over-reliance or academic integrity are gone um, because I think uh, it, it's not necessarily the, the tool itself that is good or bad or ethical or unethical. It is 
it, it, the use and the guidance we provide. So I think there's still some of some of that around. But despite the concerns, I think the overall sentiment toward generative AI among our faculty is largely positive, with many seeing it as one of the biggest um, transformative technologies to impact teaching and learning in, in, in decades, potentially. Um, and I guess I forgot to mention that uh, prior to being, uh, and still today, uh, the director of the center, I'm a faculty member and I have taught French and humanities classes since uh, the, early, the 90s, which, which is why I'm in the Center for Teaching Excellence, because I deeply love the impact we get to have on our students. Right. Two administrative leaders who also uh, continue to teach or have taught, which I think sheds a, a great light on, on the roles that you both have. So that's wonderful. Tom, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Tom Andriola. Uh, I'm the Vice Chancellor and Chief Digital Officer at UC Irvine in Southern California. Um, you know, I have a kind of a, a unique and expansive role for uh, at the university over digital initiatives that allows me to touch and have an impact on teaching, research, campus operations, patient care and health operations, because we have a large health enterprise connected to our university. And also, you know, how we think about our industry collaborations and spin out opportunities, all of which technology and now AI are, are, are playing a role. Um, the, the, I think my colleagues on the, on the panel expressed a lot of what I would say as well. You know, I think that, that maybe the one thing I'll add is, you know, fact, we talk about faculty being, you know, a monolithic thing, like any population, it's highly distributed in terms of the early adopters mm -hmm. were there on December the 1st, playing with this, trying to understand its capabilities, and in some cases, even pushing its limits. And you had others screaming for academic integrity reasons to block it at the firewall. And I think what I've seen now over, uh, you know, the let's let's call it now it's 16 months. We can't call this thing new anymore. You know, what's new, you know, it, it's not a new concept. It's a new set of tools that are evolving much quicker. I was just up at OpenAI earlier this week. These models are, are evolving much quicker than we can understand what their capabilities are. And these companies are pushing these tools out into the marketplace with the intention of people pushing their limits and being feedback about what they can and can't do and informing these companies about the, guard rail, the guide rails. And I think our industry is going to be at the front line of that for many reasons, not just teaching and learning. And so what I'm seeing kind of within our, you know, our institutional population is we're starting to wrap our heads around this. We're trying to create scaffolding to allow, I call it more players onto the playing field, trying to get their personal understanding of these new tools. It's so that they can understand how it might benefit them individually as a professional, and then also how they bring it into their pedagogy, you know, in the teaching capacity. But the rate of change of these tools is moving much faster than our ability to really assimilate an understanding of them and then to deploy them. So it's going to be an ongoing process. And um, one that quite honestly is exciting for some of us, but also scary to others. So it sums it up well, right? I think it runs that continuum of, of scary and exciting and everywhere in between with all the different uh, groups we engage with. Uh, Stuart, would you like to introduce yourself next? Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm Stuart Salber. Uh, I run the writing program at Penn State. We see 18,000 students a year in two required writing classes. So this fall, I will have 18,000 students writing with AI. And so we're in the trenches. <laughs> To repeat a line, you'll, you'll hear from me later. We have 200 teachers as well, so uh, we're doing a lot of careful thinking. Uh, I would say the campus climate is sober, and I mean that in a very productive kind of way. You look If you look historically at AI and you put it in context, you can make some sense out of it, uh, and you, you won't get caught up in the media panic. Uh, you won't get caught up in the distractions. Uh, you can keep your eye on the ball and really think about what might be productive here uh, and what, what are problems. Uh, like any technology, it's a mixed bag. Uh, uh, there will be winners and losers. Uh, that, that if, you, if you look at the history of automation, that, that's the nature of it. But, you know, here in, in higher ed, 
our goals are around learning. <laughs> so uh, if we keep our, our eye on the ball in terms of like, what are we trying to do in this course, in this curriculum, in this program, and we think about learning rather than, you know, a more kind of a instrumental outcome of a cost savings or, a, you know, what other units on campus are worried about admissions and all of that, then I think we can do a good job in making sense of what's in front of us. And uh, even as, as Tom said, even as it continues to evolve in front of us, we, we often teach about moving targets. So uh, that's, uh, that's no news for us. So I'm pretty excited about it and uh, excited to hear what others have to say. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, again, if, if folks have questions, by all means, feel free to use chat to ask the questions. And I will go ahead and ask our first question. Uh, and I think many of us here, both on the panel as, as well as uh, people viewing, are optimistic about artificial intelligence, particularly how it can assist faculty and students in the teaching and learning space. There are a lot of challenges when trying to put AI initiatives in place, particularly when you think about scale. Uh, Tom, let's start with you. What challenges do you see as you continue to explore AI's role at UC Irvine? Yeah, so um, great question, Bart. Thank you for the question. Uh, so. First and foremost, I, I feel like uh, I've transported back a couple of decades. You know, uh, there's a lot of similarities and some differences, you know, from you know, when the internet got introduced to us as a society and we grappled with some of the same issues. Uh, you, know, you know, one of the big differences is when I look in the mirror today and the person that looked in the mirror then, I don't like, you know, the person today looks a lot older than that person, but you know, the, the, the the issues are somewhat the same in terms of this impactful thing that is um, hype in the short term and really transformational in the long term that we're grappling with. One of the amazing differences, though, in the conversations as I reflect on them is the conversation when I was running around saying you need to pay attention to this new thing called the Internet. People would ask very kind of naive questions like, so why would I care about having an electronic billboard in the form of this thing you call a website? Why would I want to put my product catalog when people are always going to walk into my store? Today, we're asking much more refined questions you know, around ethical uses of these tools, equitable uses of these, these tools, um, uh, privacy implications around these tools, right? So it's a sophistication of our society overall that shows how much we've evolved while we continue to get these new tools. The, the second point I want to point to is you know, Pew Research just came out with a new research. And while we talk about, it seems like we're talking about this all the time and everyone is all in on this, working professionals in the U.S., we are still at just over one in every five has even tried to use ChatGPT. Yes, we have to kind of remember that is that uh, we're still talking about a lot of people have not even had their own personal experiences. Now, when you break down age demographics, clearly those above 50 um, are using it at one third the rate than those in the 18 to 29 range. And I bet you if you looked at, you know, 14 to 22, you would see greater than 50 percent utilization based on all the kind of hearsay and what we're hearing also from the K-12 community. But we also we have to recognize that it's still new to a lot of people, but the disparities in utilization is one of the challenges that we have to grapple with directly because our students are adopting this and, and starting to use it to try to figure out to do what they need to do faster than the people who are trying to, you know, uh, create the environment for them are using it and understanding it. And that disparity, I think, is is a lose-lose scenario for higher education if we're not careful. Um, and, and I like to tell this in terms of the impact in terms of a story. You know, story is, I call the story, two students and three professors. Uh, and the story kind of goes like this. So you have two students who get an assignment uh, in a class. Student A regurgit, you know, uses the tool to regurgitate and takes the first thing that comes out of the tool and submits the assignment. While the second one uses the tool but critically thinks about it and refines based on back and forth prompts, uses maybe a tool like perplexity beyond ChatGPT, uses perplexity to get better references and submits an assignment. And so Professor A, who, who has those two students in class, basically fails both students because of an academic integrity issue and just wanting to reject you know, where the world is taking us. Professor B takes those two assignments and basically judges the quality of the work submitted by each of the students. Student A gets a C, student, you know, student one gets an, 
a C student too gets an A because of the quality of the work submitted. But Professor C is a little different. They're one of those early adopters we have at our institution and they incorporate these tools into the assignment, you know, and, and actually brings it into discussion about how these tools can pervade, can create the right way of critically thinking about the assignment itself. Um, and what happens is, is the grades are still A and C, but the outcome when that student leaves our institution and goes into, let's say, the workforce and how they can articulate and perform because of their, not just exposure to these tools, but how we've played a role in how they use these tools. One gets a job that maybe pays $25,000 a year and the other one gets a job that pays $80,000 a year because we've prepared them better for the world that they're stepping into next. Right. So the question that I like to bring back in telling the story at my institution is, so which academy do we want to be? Because these are now our choices and each individual instructor has the ability to make that choice in their course. And then my role as an administrator playing a role in how we introduce these tools and how we upskill the organization to take advantage of these tools. How do we want to think it both individually, but also collectively? And so it's a great way of just kind of bringing what's going on into a story that everyone can figure out which character are they in the story. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I think just for the sake of time and for questions, we'll just jump right ahead to the next question. And again, looking for, for questions from the audience here too as well. Uh, so Stuart, let's, let's pivot to you for a minute. You're responsible for educating, I think you said, 18,000 undergraduates per year in writing rhetoric courses. That, that's a lot of undergrads you're responsible for there. How do you and your colleagues see AI impacting the writing curriculum over the next five years? And, and how will this impact writing pedagogy going forward? Uh, this was fun to think about. Um, it's difficult to predict the next five years, but if past is prologue, Writing pedagogy will hew closely to our theoretical and empirical developments. One of the more promising writing theories conceptualizes AI as a medium or field for action, the writers and communicators, rather than a, a simple tool. Uh, uh, so according to a post-critical perspective, which is a perspective I encourage educators to adopt on AI, AI adoption and implementation will become a fact of life in professional settings for better and worse. It will move from one to five to four out of five or five out of five. The AI platforms we adopt and implement will reflect the perspectives of their designers. It's a human artifact. It's no different than any other human artifact. Those perspectives will make strong suggestions for use, That's, but they will not preordain use. So there's plenty of room to maneuver for users and administrators and others. A variety of institutional factors will help to determine the nature and character of our AI implementations. So AI is not being implemented in a vacuum, but in a larger institutional context that already has priorities, approaches, and so on. I think the next one's crucial. The same AI technology will come to mean different things to different people in different contexts. It's plastic, right? It's not one thing, which is what Tom discovered early on in looking across a, the field of his uh, institution. And a key objective for all teachers is to investigate possibilities, identify problems, and promote a classroom in which AI is treated as both an educational subject and a platform for work. And I think that's crucial. We don't just attend to it as a platform for work, but also as an educational subject. Some even claim that a post-critical approach to writing can help humans and non-humans live justly together in uncertainty. Time will tell, of course, but what the theory buys us now is the imperative to explore the nuances of meaning and practice that exist between two polarized views. AI will either revolutionize teaching and learning or it will destroy literacy. Both views are reductive and harmful and do very little to help teachers move forward productively. Over the next five years, we'll need to develop an approach to writing with the following first principle. 
AI requires students to know more, not less, about what constitutes effective writing. This will also be true for coding, research, or any other task that enlists the capabilities of AI. You can't use it mindlessly. And as ed educators, we certainly don't want our students to outsource learning to a robot. Now, I've not been able to find any mention of the writing models informing the work of AI companies, but their, uh, their promises often allied the complexities of language and language use. What's important for us to remember is this. AI produces mathematical responses to human communication problems. These problems are, these responses are based on statistical probability, on pattern matching, on math for a massive corpus of decontextualized texts. And while the output can be useful and interesting in all sorts of ways, we've already tried and dismissed mathematical approaches to writing because they separate texts from their action context and thus fail to attend the, to the specificities of writing situations. I defy a writing robot to interpret the salient gaps in a research literature, to determine what, what motivates my readers, to design a website based more on strategy than conventions of the genre, or to reason through the ethical considerations in the use of active and passive voice. When it comes to writing anything, with any stakes at all. Expert humans will most certainly need to be in the loop much, if not most of the time, somewhere. And the nature of this somewhere will be a huge focus over the next five years. By this I mean, what is the where of AI? Where in the writing process should students use AI? And how, for example, I discourage the use of AI in first drafts because of the crucial role first drafts play in helping students figure out what they want to say and how they want to say it. But AI can be more useful in both earlier and later phases. AI can both assist writing and create problems for writers. So in this way, it's no different than any other technology in the history of literacy. And what we already know about writing will go some way toward helping us make sense of AI. It won't go the whole way. The relationship is dialectical. We shouldn't apply what we think we know about writing to AI. We should also think about how AI challenges how we want to think about writing. Thank you, Stuart. And, and Amy, you share a disciplinary background with Stuart. I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are there, if you put that hat on. Sure. I'm. Yeah. Well, I mean, within composition and rhetoric, when we study the history of rhetoric, you know, writing itself is a technology that was initially feared, right? Um, the sense that people would not be able to use their memories if they relied on texts that were written down. So I think this is a fear that goes through evolutionary change. But I think um, that that what Stuart is saying is exactly right. You know, how do we help students ask the questions that they need to ask? And, and getting back to what Tom was saying about world readiness, I mean, this is a, a in career preparation. You know, what kind of higher education are we preparing our students for? I don't think we've even begun to appreciate how AI is impacting our future understanding of what work is, what our relationship of work professional identity, what will that mean in 10, 15, 20 years? Um, and thinking about that as a, of a provocation. Um, so the, the Boyer 2030 blueprint, which is um, focused on undergraduate education at research universities, has identified world readiness as one of its provocations uh, that needs to catalyze universities to achieve what it frames as the equity excellence imperative. And we've heard a lot of conversation around not only um, access, but equity in access to these tools and what that means uh, for our students. And I, I was just thinking last week, I was in a conversation with a student who was creating a video for a class um, he's a biology major and he was he had videotaped animals and he was trying to use 
uh, an app for that would allow him to create Morgan Freeman's voice, right, <laughs> on this app um, for his video. But he didn't want to purchase it because it would be $20 a month. And he could only do 18 seconds at a time of this five minute video. And that for me, was an, an equity issue, right? That he's trying to create this, use this tool to create this pro class project, but he was having to, you know, do it so tediously compared to those students who could just purchase the product. So I think we also need to think about access and equity. Who has, who can use these tools? How do we ensure all of our students have access to these tools? And how do we ensure that our faculty are prepared you know, to engage students in these types of conversations, which would, which is what Alexandra was talking about. Hey, thank you. Uh, so we have some good questions coming in. So I think we'll do one more question here that we prepared before the, the panel, and then we'll jump into some audience questions. Uh, so the faculty development component related to artificial intelligence continues to grow and, and is growing very rapidly. Uh, it feels like many of us are in the early stages of working with faculty who are excited to explore, explore AI uh, and identify best practices to support faculty and students. Alexandra, how are you and your colleagues at the University of Florida and the Teaching and Learning Center collaborating with faculty to help explore this new frontier? Um, so I think, it, it, I mean, I, I just want to say first off that I think it's a university-wide effort. You know, we, we really have embedded or have worked to embed AI across the curriculum or think about it in those terms. And I also think that as a teaching excellence center, um, we're, we don't hold the expertise in teaching excellence in this center by ourselves. It is shared by all of our faculty and all of our colleagues across campus. So by all means, the sum of all of our partners across campus who have expertise in different areas is much greater than the parts. And what we've really worked to do is highlight that and bring that to the forefront. So all of the um, professional development and, and, and learning opportunities we've created uh, for our faculty and our graduate students are really hand in hand with all of our partners who bring diverse perspectives um, and, and expertise from across all 16 colleges. And that's what makes what we can offer much better and richer for our faculty and graduate students and postdocs. Um, I think two years ago, our very first like um, uh, foray into this space was a faculty learning community. Uh, we actually built two, one with AI faculty and one with uh, folks who, were, who considered themselves absolute beginners, who did not picture themselves in the um, AI space. And this is before ChatGPT exploded. And they were really just interested to, to see where they might fit in at this AI university and in this space, given that they might be teaching history. And so I really loved what you said, Stuart, about you know looking at it historically, because these two groups eventually merged and created this lovely handbook that looked at AI across pop culture, across history, across all these things, and really gave everyone a feeling that somewhere in this space, I belong and I can share things with my students. Um, and that eventually helped us to, that and our partnership with our, our um, other centers across campus like the AI Squared Center, helped us to develop other resources that we figured folks needed, including um, two other learning communities, which were instrumental in really getting this, this groundwork across all colleges. Uh, folks who collaborated and could share ideas. So we had something called Harnessing AI for Teaching and Learning. Um, and uh, that was a year long endeavor and everyone in there was able to really transform part of their course in, in a very um, uh, inspiring way. Uh, and then we also did one based on the course that Auburn developed and that, that, that learning community was called uh, Teaching AI in the SEC and that met biweekly and went through that course. And again, same, um, same result. Those, the, the first folks were tasked with course transformation and sharing those results at, at our annual teaching and learning conference. And the second learning community was asked to contribute to our repository of assignments and assessments uh, for AI. Um, and then we built some resources that anyone can access at any time. Um, so a resource library that really helped folks just kind of, you know, if you weren't ready to invest a whole year's worth of your time, maybe you could just go read something. And then we developed a workshop series. So we really wanted to meet everyone where they were, right? Not everyone has a whole year to invest. Not everyone feels 
willing or confident enough to jump into a, an advanced workshop. So where, where do we meet people? And so we built a getting started with AI workshop series. That's a little bit less. It's an hour and a half of your time and it explores different aspects. And there are you know, four that you can, and, and we're growing it, that you can jump into and really get an idea and a feel and then see what you want to do next, right? And then we're going to continue with our learning communities. What we found is that individual departments use AI very differently. And then when they see our Getting Started with AI series, our learning communities, they uh, partner with us to build a workshop that is tailored to them and their uses and their needs. So we've, we've visited many of our colleges and customized um, after meeting with both their faculty and administrators, really what their, what their specific needs were. And then, again, we have an annual teaching conference that folks consider the teaching idea toolbox. And so if you only have one day, this is the place for you, right? Um, and we found that we really need to recognize that effort, right? It is, a, it is an enormous lift to ask people to rethink how they may have been doing things. And we want to recognize that work and the impact it will have on students as they, um, as many of you have said, as they, they prepare for their careers, uh, as they navigate um, higher education. And so we, we developed a series of awards that really recognize the folks who are just dipping their toes in, to the folks who've transformed the course, to the course who, to the folks who functioned as champions across our campus. And so we, I think we've really built this in a scaffolded, at your own, you know, at your own comfort level and with your own interest space or, or ideology. And I think that is what has made it work for a lot of our folks. Um, but there's still so much to do. Um, and so we're, we're really, uh, we're really pleased with that. And I think, you know, just to, just to share with everyone, everything that we've built with our partners um, is visible on our website, which is teach.ufl.edu. So just like, it's not a shameless plug, but we want to share what we've done and get feedback. Uh, and then and then also hear from you and learn from everyone else as well, you know, so I think that's... And Unison will hope to help spread those around too, part of the consortial model, right? So we can bring all these resources together. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting that, that came to my mind is, uh, you know, this notion of, uh, Stuart, I think you mentioned the media frenzy, right, that, that seems to be surrounding this. Uh, Alexandra, you talked about rethinking, you know, things that, with, with technology like this. It reminded me when I started my career the year 2000, it was in online learning. And, you know, at that point, the vast majority of faculty I worked with were opposed. This is never going to work. You can't teach people online the way we teach people face to face, right? And as you look at the history of some of these disruptive innovations, you start to learn that arguably in teaching, the first disruptive innovation was the chalkboard. How in the world am I gonna turn my back on a room full of students, right? And, and, and you know, see how the chalkboard changed things. So that it's interesting and I think rethinking how this will sort of change things 10 years from now, I think is a, a fun space to be in. So we have a lot of questions here from the audience. Uh, let me start out here with a question from Brad. Uh, Brad says, I wonder if, as with past major tech innovations, there's an opportunity or need to rethink roles, in particularly, maybe assurance of learning should be separated from assessment of and for learning, and free faculty to focus on the latter and shift the former out of the class to the program level, or institutional level, or professional bodies. He's just interested in some of your reflections on how there might be shifts in roles as it relates to, to AI and teaching and learning. So. That's out there for whoever wants to jump in and tackle that one. I'll I'll take a shot at it, but I, I it, it, I'm going to take maybe a different angle than my colleagues will. Uh, so so first of all, you know I, I want to recognize Alexandra and her institution, right? Because they're one of the ones that we're following here. Uh, because I, I listened to her former provost Joe Glover get up on stage in front of his peers and basically say, you know, this is a you know system change is a team sport was what he said to his colleagues, right? Which means like this technology movement is really all about human change and it's an all in thing and everyone in the institution plays a role. And that really spoke to me and it's and it's part of the playbook. I, I think, you know, to, to, the, to the question, Bart, I think there's, um, I think there's a couple things that, playbooks that we developed previously that have come into play here. Um, I think, you know, the active learning movement 
and we went big into the active learning movement. We set up capabilities to quote unquote help faculty kind of move over into this new paradigm, have have helped us when we had to transition very quickly in, in the pandemic and now in the post pandemic where we have to transition yet again to figure out a new set of tools. So I, I think we've got some playbooks that have allowed us to become a little bit more agile as an organization. Um, but I also you know, want to recognize that the institution has to be all in on the movement. And I think that's something that we talk about a lot uh, at cabinet level discussions. Other thoughts on changing roles? Maybe take one more before we move on. Oh, hold on, Stuart. I think I had you muted. Let me unmute you. Or I think you might have to find the unmute button there on the bottom center of your screen. Was it a question about changing roles of, of students and teachers or of, of other institutional agents? I wasn't clear on that. It seems to be more around the role of faculty in uh, assurance of learning and assessment of learning. I mean, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is that uh, learning is actually can actually be a very inefficient process, like trial and error. <laughs> I mean, if, if you look at learning and how it happens in works, we have to have space for that exploration and failure and uh, so uh, I, I would just say, you know, uh, institutions are interested in efficiencies, in streamlining, uh, finding gains. I get all of that. We have to. We have as big of a budget deficit right now as anybody. <laughs> so, so believe me. But we actually have to reserve. We, we can't let that bleed into thoughtful learning practices, which should be taking up AI, but not with the goal of... Uh, you know, the same kind of instrumental goals around efficiency, you know, we should we should sometimes be very inefficient. There is no way around the labor problem. If you take writing seriously, right, then there is no way around the difficult labor of paying attention to student writing from end to end. And if you don't do that, then students can just uh, outsource their writing to a robot. The answer to, play, to AI plagiarism is super simple. Pay attention to student writing. It's not possible when you do that uh, and invite the robot into student writing. But now imagine most of the university doesn't teach writing. It assigns it and collects it. <laughs> and if that's what you do, if you assign writing and collect writing, AI creates big problems and missed opportunities. But if you pay attention to writing, then that's, that's inefficient and expensive, it's expensive, you have to keep your class sizes down, but people will learn a lot about how to be good writers and they will learn how to write with robots. So um, I would just keep that in mind. Great, thank you. So another question that came in and, and I, I'll try and broaden this a little bit and then use an example. So uh, privacy. So when we think about privacy, how are your institutions uh, concerned with things like institutional research, institutional data uh, being exposed to, you know, commercial models, right? Those kinds of things. And, and just how are you making sure that uh, data that should remain private remains private, remains private at your institution in relation to the models? I've thought a lot about this. I'll keep it short since I just talked. But, you know, Penn State has four levels of, of information types, right? From less to more secure. You can ask 100 faculty members, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the schema, what's the classification for information type? The, nobody would, could tell you what that is. And, and, and thankfully, most teaching materials fit into level one. And... Uh, and we're using Copilot behind Penn State credentials, so we're not feeding out our materials. But teachers don't even know how to think about this issue. There hasn't been great messaging, but also we don't we don't even tend to think about it. So not until you get into like IRB and other things that re require you to think about it. So 
much of the discussion around this is not ironically is not happening happening in the teaching and learning space yeah i i would agree I, this has become a topic of conversation in our english department for faculty who want to use uh, things like chat gbt within the classroom and the issue of then students materials will be utilized for these large models without their consent and what what does that mean if they don't want their materials to be you know used in these huge databases but yet their faculty are requiring them to participate pedagogically as part of the course so that's been one issue that has has popped up on our campus i i would say our experience is is this was one of the um huge one of the initial hurdles to get more people to start uh, in, uh, interacting and playing with these tools. So we took a strategy to curate our own, sounds very similar to what uh, Stuart said for Penn State, curate our own you know, GPT models that we supported as a service and basically said, look, this first iteration is about protecting privacy, making sure if you put your data in there, it's not going out for these companies to grab and use for their next training uh, iteration. And we just want you to come onto the playing field and start experimenting with this thing to understand it before you then can figure out how you make money use it. So we, we, we saw the privacy issue as one that was keeping people from engaging. And so our first iteration of created a curated set of GPT tools for the institution was really about getting people past the security and privacy concerns that were keeping them from getting started in the journey. Yeah, I'm gonna follow that up with We've, we've done the same thing so with Copilot and Chat GPT all have gone through risk assessment and you know are at varying places in that process and, and we have and they're behind our copilot at least will be behind our um, our security. But um, I think it's also an educational piece, right? For both students and faculty. You know, we we do our FERPA training, we do those kinds of trainings, but it's really important to whenever we share new practices or new ideas or discuss uses and applications in our courses or even for our students, sharing with them you know, how this can be used and, and what are the best ways to, to use it and what to do and what not to do because it is a gray, a gray landscape that can be really difficult. But making sure you know, um, that that's embedded in any kind of um, learning opportunity at, at all levels, you know, what can be used and what can't, and, and in what context. Yeah, yeah, to, be, uh, to you know, to Alexander's point, right? I mean, I, I think institutions, we own a responsibility to, to create a literacy for our students as they leave us for responsible and ethical use of these tools. Because I have some great stories I could share about people figuring out how to game with the use of these tools to get access to like a car for one dollar someone told me a story about yesterday you know and so here's a tool fantastic but the ethical use of the tool is brought into question what you know we have a role you know or the opportunity to play a role in helping our students understand not just how to use them but to use them in the most appropriate ways yeah and in a context where so much is unsettled that, that's what's challenging i mean students own the intellectual property to the writing they do in a college classroom. So if that gets fed out for training, then you know this is the situation OpenAI is in with the New York Times. And we will see what the courts decide. I've heard lawyers say this is an extinction level event uh, if it goes the way of folks like the New York Times, even though their content is less than a percent of what the robot was trained on because they didn't ask anybody's permission to use that copyrighted material for training purposes. They're gonna claim fair use. If you know anything about the fair use clause, it just doesn't make any sense how that's fair use, but there's no other legal, legal mechanism for mounting a defense. Uh, meanwhile, those are legal, unsettled legal distinctions. Over here, we have institutional policy and pedagogy and learning. And so, it, 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 what Tom is saying is absolutely right. What we have to, the literacy that we have to uh, be focusing on is teaching students how to reason through decision-making and in, in integrating AI-generated content into their own work, whether it has to do with legal liability, 
copyright or just effective communication. It's a wonderful space for education. I, I don't care so much about the outcomes of any particular AI things. Uh, you know, those are, like I said, those are going to be a mixed bag, but we should be graduating people who can think through uh, what all of this might mean. And, um, and then we'll be doing our job. Uh, we have a question that's a, a follow-up to uh, kind of the question about shifting roles. So we mentioned that, uh, you know, the quote, Tom, you gave from, from the, the provost from Florida about cabinet-level conversations. So the question is, do you think those conversations about changing roles happen at lower levels of institutions? And what can or should institution cabinet offers do to ensure those paradigmatic change conversations move beyond just... Uh, cabinet rooms or board rooms? So I can talk a little bit about how we're thinking and, and executing around that, right? So, you know, how does it get beyond cabinet level conversations? Is cabinet members being willing to go out and, and talk and, and lay some, some framework and perspective when they speak to the organization? So, our chancellor and provost have kind of a, an annual tour that they do to all the schools and invite, you know, the faculty and the staff from those schools to engage with them in a, in a mini town hall. Make sure that we're dropping some things this year in around, you know, kind of our perspective on AI, you know, how, where we want people to be. Uh, I think Alexandra's example of um, communities of practice are hugely, you know, important in institutions like ours, just the way we, that we work peer to peer um, sharing and influencing is the way that adoption happens, not from any top-down initiative, right? So give people the opportunities to share what they're doing. We took a page from what we heard at Wisconsin doing, we call it digital discoveries. Every other Friday, there's an opportunity for someone doing interesting, some, uh, something interesting with AI to share their work to an open audience. Uh, the audience can ask questions, we record it, we put it in a resource library. So if you didn't want to get up at 8 a.m. on Friday morning to listen to the to the webcast live, you could you know listen to it afterwards and have contact information. That's the way that that change happens at our institutions, right? Leadership has to show where they're at, you know, to a point Amy made. When we talk about it, we need to talk about the equity component, right? You know, it's one of the big things for us turning it on for students is you know, we have students who can pay $20 a month are getting access to better tools while other students are being left behind and maybe even further and further left behind in the future. So we need to give this to the entire population as an institution. That message has to not stay in the cabinet room. It needs to go to the entire organization so that people know where does the institution stand. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, I, I think higher education is inherently conservative uh, you know, because faculty are hired to do in, in general, their individual research, they're not hired usually to be part of a team to work in collaboration. And so we're always trying to address that tension. There are amazing communities of practice, like Alexandra talked about that, that I, you know, are very powerful, if you are a participant in them. And so I'm always trying to think about who are, who's not involved <laughs> and how do the ways that we even structure our hiring practices and the ways that we allow faculty, of course, we want academic freedom, but what does that mean in terms of the delivery of pedagogy at the intersection of these movements that we're trying to respond to? So I do think it very much, as Tom said, comes from peer to peer influencers. It's not having someone like me say, hey, everybody, you need to do this in your curriculum. It's, it's having the students demand that in order to be world ready, that they need these skills. And I've seen our students are really the ones on our campus who are sort of leading faculty to dip their toes and to think about what it might mean for their pedagogy. So I think it really, really does have to be more of a ground movement um, because the ways that we conceptualize and legalize our roles do not require us to be adaptive to any change. I'm just going to add a little a, a little something here and say that those conversations that both Tom and Amy are referring to, those communities of practice, those 
those opportunities to discuss and share are amplified when it crosses the boundaries of colleges and departments. Um, so it is much more valuable when we bring uh, uh, people from different areas with different experiences to the table to be able to share because then we can we can con construct shared meaning, shared understanding that really has um, greater impacts and longevity. But I also think we're going to need some new structures. Like I've been in a lot of communities of practice and we do great things, but they don't feed back up to Tom in any kind of formal way as part of the uh, decision making. And so if I was at Tom's uh, institution, I would say, Tom, I want to be your special assistant. I want you to have a faculty member <laughs> at your hip if you can stomach that as you uh, honestly, as you are at, in cabinet level uh, meetings. I, I'm in these meetings here at Penn State because uh, I found my way into them because I'm in charge of 18,000 students a year. And so there's a place for me anywhere I'm willing to sit, which, which is not typical. But it, the, the conversation is completely different. When you, when you change that cabinet level meeting and you, you actually are willing to involve, uh, I mean, look, the cabinet needs faculty members and faculty members need the cabinet. <laughs> you know, we can't, I can't do the things I want to do in AI for 18,000 students without uh, uh, the infrastructure, technical and, and, and social and, and uh, human. Uh, so we need each other desperately. But the governance that I see, both the, the, the faculty governance structures and the IT governance structures, they don't always map onto each other very well. And we got to hack that somehow, or more than hack it. I don't want to just hack it. I want to kind of change it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, T Tom knows who I am. Uh, he's he's going to text me about something. Uh, you know, I mean, th this is the relationship I think faculty need with IT folks and, and vice versa. I think that gets to the communities of practice shouldn't only include faculty, you know, staff, I think are a totally ignored resource on, on our campus for these discussions. And when we think about communities of practice, for me, the mo more power comes not only from cross-disciplinary, but cross-functional teams that include staff from many different points in the organization as well, working with faculty instead of in silos. So we're almost out of time. There's one question here that I think makes a good question to end on. And I invite everyone to give a just a quick initial thought to, to round out the panel here. Uh, the rate of change was brought up earlier, right? You know, Amy said higher ed's usually conservative. Sometimes higher education is a little slow in change, right? And, and adapting to change. Uh, the question's really about how, how do we balance this or what are new change management strategies or practices we are going to need to think about to try and keep up faster than we typically, you know, traditionally have in higher ed to just the, the rate of change here. Uh, so Stuart, you want to start with this one and then we'll just go around the panelists and, and wrap up. I, I would just challenge the question a little bit. I, I, I think it's exactly right that these, and Tom said it early on, this stuff is moving much more quickly than other things, uh, and we can be too slow. But like we're like the law; the law is too slow, but for a good reason. Uh, so we we want to be deliberative and judicious. For a little bit behind, um, it, it depends on what we're behind on exactly. Uh, but so many things are unsettled anyway that I feel like some people on the bleeding edge are spending a lot of time on disposable particulars, and they're forgetting the things to remember forever. And, and so that's how I think about it. Great. Alexandra, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I think the pandemic was probably our like, our, our like moment of we like fell off a cliff in like, in like a day, you know, and that experience maybe helped prepare folks a little bit for having, you know, along with some of the other things we've had to pivot over time for. But I think that one was, you know, probably marked in people's memory. I will say that good teaching and good uh, learning experiences are not dependent on technology and new tools, right? Um, so uh, I, I think as Stuart was saying, it's those those will stay. Those will stay, they'll just be, be modified over time. And for us to take the time to do that well, I think is okay. I think 
doing it in in too much of a hurry um, may not result in in um, the outcomes we hope for. But again, to echo somebody from earlier, is um, mistakes will happen. This will be iterations, right? Yeah. It yeah. won't be. Yeah. We won't get there all at once. Failure's the best teacher, right? All right, we're at time, but I still want to give Tom and then Amy just a quick thought on the, the change management here. Um, I would just say identify what can stop, what people can stop doing in order to accommodate the time and space they need to think collectively and work collaboratively. Um, I feel like we just keep adding expectations on to our faculty and staff and, and never stop doing things. So. Yeah, you know, colleagues that have, have all said it. You know, I'll just add. You know, uh, I like to always say I like to. Res we have to respect that this is an individual journey for everyone involved, and which is which is you know very much built into kind of how our foundational strategy to give everyone an opportunity to engage with these tools and adopt these tools at the rate that they're comfortable with and use peer to peer influence to get people to figure out what's the speed. Our institutions are built to last a long period of time. The, the one tension point that I really always like to bring back out is, look, we are dealing with a, you know, a crisis of confidence in higher education as a sector with the outside world, that if we are too slow to evolve to this new change, to the, I call it the age of augmented intelligence, we will find that confidence, that crisis of confidence worsen at a time when we cannot afford that. And so that tension we have to bring for everyone in our institution to understand. Whether they like it or not, it's a reality that we're dealing with when you look at survey results. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. This is a great panel, great discussion. I appreciate you all willing to give your time to the Unison Summit. I know our attendees appreciate it well. Uh, and to everyone participating today, we're going to have about a 15-minute break, and then concurrent sessions will spin up here in about 15